And now is my great pleasure and honor to introduce our first keynote speaker, Lord Professor John Krebs. Professor Krebs earned his degree in zoology in 66, PhD in 1970 from Pembroke College, Oxford. Afterwards, he worked as a laboratory demonstrator, demonstrator in ornithology at Oxford. And later as an assistant professor in eco of ecology at the University of British Columbia. He returned to Oxford as university lecturer in zoology at the Edwin Gray Institute of Field in Ornithology and became a Royal Society Research Professor at Oxford, followed by a position as Chief Executive of Natural Environment Research Council and between 2000 and 2005 as Chairman of the UK Food Standards Agency. Professor Krebs received 16 honorary degrees and many other prizes, awards, and medals. He is a member of the UK Parliament House of Lords and chaired its Science Technology Select Committee. He also served as president of British Science Association since 2000, 2012, member of the UK Climate Change Committee and chairman of his Adaptation Subcommittee, and chief executive of Natural Environment Research Council Faculty of Jesus College, Oxford. He served as well as the trustee of the Newfield Foundation. I made this short, yes? I don't want to talk about hobbies and so on, okay? Because everybody's talking about this. Uh, he is going to give us a lecture, and the title of his presentation is Scientific Advice and Policy Making in the UK, with emphasis on environment, climate change, and the policy for control in animal diseases. Professor Lord Krebs, please. Thank you very much for those uh, words of introduction, and thank you very much for inviting me to give this talk. Uh, it was an unexpected pleasure. I had uh, planned through the British Embassy to spend a few days in Israel and then to my good fortune, I was invited to give this presentation. Uh, I should, uh, in case you're worried about it, uh, point out that I uh, am actually not giving this presentation until next year. But um, <laughs> so you've got to think forward uh, 12 months. Um, as, um, as was just explained in the introduction, I'm going to talk about some of the relationship between science and policy, and of course, like many people who ended up where I ended up in the interface between science and policy, I started out uh, in the first uh, 25 to 30 years of my career as uh, a basic scientist doing ecological and behavioral research. Uh, so it was quite an unexpected change in my career when I ended up working at the interface between science and policy, uh, and I hope to be able to show you uh, some of the fruits of that, that work. I'm really going to uh, illustrate my theme with um, three examples. And the first of those is to do with animal disease. Uh, the second is to do with uh, the global challenge of climate change and how we are tackling that in the UK. And the third is what may be the most important part of the talk in terms of its impact on our futures and our children's and grandchildren's futures, but is in the too difficult tray because I don't think uh, science has yet provided uh, a suitable answer, a suitable form of advice for politicians, and maybe it never will, but I hope to challenge you into thinking about that. So first of all, um, animal disease, and the particular disease I'm going to talk about is one that um, is hugely important in the United Kingdom uh, for the um, beef and dairy industry. Um, and I got involved in the policy and the science of this disease in the mid-1990s when the then uh, head of the Agriculture Ministry, the Minister for Agriculture, uh, asked me to review the scientific evidence that underpinned the current government policy then in the mid-1990s and come up with some recommendations. And since then, as I'll explain, the story has unfolded in many different ways, and it's a beautiful example of how uh, science and policy uh, do and don't interact with one another. So what is the disease? It's um, bovine tuberculosis. And bovine tuberculosis 
um, has a big impact uh, in the UK uh, farming industry, and that important thing is that impact is growing. So if you just look at this map, each red dot, this is 1986, shows a farm with bovine tuberculosis. And there are hardly any red dots here. Unless you've got very good eyesight, you might hardly detect them. Here we are in 2009, where the disease is now affecting a very large number of farms in the southwest of England, in Cornwall, Devon, and Dorset, up into the West Midlands, and in South Wales. So you can see that in 2012, the last figures I could find from the government website, uh, 5,000 new herds were affected. That's 5% of all herds in the country. But if you imagine that year on year, it soon adds up to a very big number. Um, 37,000 cattle uh, were slaughtered because they had bovine tuberculosis. And uh, most of that is in the southwest of England and Wales. So in this part of the country, it's absolutely devastating. And what the government says on its website is that it's one of the biggest challenges for the UK cattle industry. It's costing the taxpayer about £100 million a year in compensation to farmers and, um, and in the costs of, of control measures. Um, I should say, just as a historical note, um, back in the 1930s in Britain, bovine tuberculosis was a significant uh, human health risk, and that's because people drank raw milk, unpasteurized milk. And it's estimated that about 3,000 people per year died from bovine tuberculosis, mainly contracted as a result of drinking raw milk. At the time, in the mid-1930s, the parliament decided that there was not a big enough risk to warrant regulating requ the requirement to pasteurize milk. Uh, and that didn't come in until 1949. I just put that as in parenthesis, because if you think today, uh, if the, the white stuff you buy in a cardboard carton or a plastic jug from the supermarket were killing, uh, in the UK, of course, a larger country, but killing several thousand people a year, there would be complete outrage. So our attitude towards risk has changed hugely. Uh, but today, bovine TB is not a human health risk because, first of all, cattle are regularly tested, and if they test positive for the disease, then they're either slaughtered or uh, their meat and uh, milk can't go into the food chain. Uh, and furthermore, milk on general sale has to be pasteurized. You can still buy raw milk if you go directly to a farm, uh, but then it's clear you're taking a risk uh, that isn't the risk that the normal consumer would take. So we're talking about an animal health risk and a risk to the farming industry, not a human health risk. Now, so that's the problem. Um, when we had a change of government in 2010, four years, four and a bit years ago, we'd had a long period of a Labour government, uh, and the Labour government had adopted a particular policy on bovine tuberculosis, mainly based on my recommendations. When the coalition, Conservative and Liberal Democrat government came in, they changed the policy overnight. And uh, a particular aspect of the policy is to do with the interaction between wildlife and cattle, because there is a wildlife reservoir of the disease uh, in a, a carnivore. I'm not sure whether you get them in Israel, the badger, but it's a small black and white carnivore. And here is uh, what Nature, the science magazine Nature, wrote shortly after the, there's a badger. Uh, what the, uh, after the coalition came in, uh, they said, well, badgers may not seem to be a particularly pressing issue for the scientific community, but they are a signal of how the new government will respond to scientific advice and evidence. So the policy changed, and it changed in a way that appeared to conflict with the uh, scientific advice. And I want to explain what lay behind that. So uh, just to tell you about bovine tuberculosis and badgers, um, when I carried out my review in the mid-1990s, I concluded that uh, badgers <clears throat> definitely are a wildlife reservoir, and they can transmit uh, bovine tuberculosis to cattle. Uh, but the government really wanted to know, could we control the disease in cattle by bearing down on the wildlife reservoir? Was that the answer? And what I said in my report was, we don't know. If you want to find out, government, uh, carry out uh, a field experiment and see what happens if you take areas of the country and you try and eradicate badgers and you take other areas as controls, uh, what ends up with the result if you follow it for many years? And to my surprise, 
uh, because this was a very costly proposition, uh, probably the largest ecological experiment ever carried out in the United Kingdom, uh, the government accepted that recommendation and it became known as the randomized badger culling trial because it was set up as a randomized design or for short, unfortunately, it was called the Krebs trial, which got me a lot of uh, hate coverage in the press because the badger lovers assumed that I was in favor of killing badgers. Uh, on the other hand, the farmers assumed I was not in favor of killing badgers, so I was hated by everybody, which is, uh, you know, the way to go. Um, so the experiment consisted of three treatments, and the three treatments were each replicated uh, ten times in a randomized design, and the treatments were control, do nothing, uh, try to eradicate badgers, that's an extreme measure, and the intermediate was to eradicate badgers just when a farm had uh, an outbreak of TB, then go in and try and destroy the badgers on that farm. And here you get a sense of the scale of it, so here's the map of the southwest of England, and these different uh, shaded and ringed areas show the, the 10 different treatment areas. So it's spread over a very large part of the country. Each block, uh, the experimental and the control blocks, was 100 square kilometers. So it's a massive experiment that ran, uh, the, the culling program ran for about uh, six or seven years, and then it's been followed subsequently. Uh, so what did that experiment show? The results were really very surprising, completely unexpected. So um, this is after nine years, the average and 95% confidence intervals inside the cull area. Sure enough, by massive effort, this is the treatment where you try to obliterate the badgers completely. After massive effort, uh, in nine years later, you end up with, um, with quite wide confidence intervals. Uh, roughly a quarter of the cases of TB have been, have been prevented, so there's a reduction. Uh, on the other hand, if you look just outside the cull area, there's been an increase. And that increase was actually higher at the beginning, but over the long period was about a 9% increase. And if you, um, of course, these, uh, the outside ring and the core area are of different uh, sizes. So if you calculate the surface area of those two regions and calculate the net benefit of this huge program of trying to eliminate badgers, the net benefit is about a 15% reduction in TB. So what on earth is going on? Well, it shows that in order to understand what's going on, you actually have to understand the ecology of the wildlife. And once you understand it, it's very simple, that badgers are highly territorial. They defend group territories. And if you go in and remove a group from its uh, underground set, they live in large underground burrows, what happens is that a new group moves in because the, the whole countryside is saturated, but there are wandering uh, badgers that don't have territories, and then new individuals that come in bring new infection, because often the ones that are unable to get a territory in the first place are the weaker and more infected badgers. So the reason for this increase outside in the outside area was the disturbance of all the badgers moving around and bringing in new infection, and the decrease in the core of the uh, cull area was that uh, because you kept on serially removing new badgers as they come in. So it's not as simple as kill the wildlife and get rid of the problem. So on the basis of, um, of that result, when uh, the Labour government saw that result, and I spoke to the then, uh, mini the, by the way, the Ministry of Agriculture disappeared in the program in, in, while this was going on, uh, and it was renamed the Department for Environment, Food and Rural Affairs, but still the same people. And they, they had the Secretary of State, the uh, senior minister, looked at these results and he said, well, we don't think that killing badgers, which is going to be a huge cost and a huge public uh, uh, issue because people like badgers, they're much loved because they appear in children's stories, we're not going to go down that route. When the coalition came in, they'd announced already beforehand, we are going to change the policy, we're going to get a grip on this disease because the disease is still increasing and we're going to start killing badgers. When the government uh, chief scientist of the day, Sir John Beddington, uh, said to the Prime Minister, but what about the results of this uh, long-term uh, field experiment, the Krebs trials? The Prime Minister was clearly completely unaware of it, and he'd made up his mind on the policy without asking whether there was any evidence to support it. Uh, so what would work? Well, the, we're still not absolutely sure, but the most recent and thorough analysis is a paper that appeared in Nature um, just uh, 
a, a month or so ago by Matt Keeling from Warwick University and his students. And they built, uh, I think, the most sophisticated population model of the disease. So it's a mechanistic model that looks at all the routes of transmission and is spatially explicit and encompasses 134,000 farms over a period of uh, 15 years. And the different routes of transmission, cattle give it to other cattle, uh, the wildlife, the environment gives it to cattle, and uh, cattle are transferred between farms, sometimes carrying the disease with them. And what this uh, modeling exercise, which I think is the, the state of knowledge summarized, is that a crucial element of the spread of the disease is not the wildlife reservoir, but the fact that the test for bovine TB has a low sensitivity, it's only 72% sensitive. So that means many infected animals get through, even though they've got an infection, they're not detected, and those animals are then sold on to other farms. They move between farms. Uh, and that's the biggest cause. New infections, most new infections from cattle movements, and from a relatively small number of farms. So there are some farmers who specialize in buying in cows and then moving them on quite quickly to other farms, and those are the uh, villains that are spreading the disease. So if you really want to control the disease, controlling wildlife, and this <coughs> modeling exercise by Matt Keeling, again, coming from a different point, comes up with a figure that removing the wildlife source would have a modest, maybe 15% effect in reducing the disease, but the real way to bear down on the disease would be to either improve the uh, efficiency of the test, to put a lot of research efforts into getting a better test, or to uh, really um, bear down on cattle movements by saying that whenever a single animal in a herd is infected, the whole herd has to be slaughtered because they may be infected, but not, the, the infection is not picked up in the test. Um, and the other possibility would be to develop a vaccine. And the government is investing in vaccine development, but the current vaccine is not uh, effective enough to act as a control to reduce the intrinsic rate of increase of the disease to below one. Furthermore, vaccination introduces trade issues because the rest of Europe wouldn't accept uh, meat or dairy products from being vaccinated animals. So this is a story that hasn't yet uh, reached the last chapter, but what I wanted to show you was how scientific evidence, the government spent a lot of money garnering scientific evidence, but then in the end uh, didn't use it in quite the way that they might have done. So I now want to switch to my second theme, which is one that affects all of us. Uh, Bovine TB is a local uh, UK issue. The Republic of Ireland also has a problem, but in Europe, those are the only two countries that really suffer a major TB problem. But climate change is something that affects everybody on the globe as much. You in Israel, maybe more even than in the UK. And, and here in the UK, um, in 2008, which was shortly after I joined the Upper House of Parliament, there was complete universal support for introducing a, a law on climate change. And that law was passed in, into a, an act of parliament in 2008 called the Climate Change Act, and it has two elements. On the one hand, it commits the United Kingdom to reduce its greenhouse gas emissions to 80% below 1990 levels by 2050. And uh, the way that that was calculated, that number, was on a sort of global equity argument, that if every person on the planet um, was uh, allowed to emit uh, two tons of carbon per year, that would um, roughly be sufficient to stabilize uh, uh, the climate. And if you looked at what the UK's share would be, uh, we would have to reduce by 80% to get us down to this two tons per person per year from where we were. If you were in America, you'd have to uh, reduced by 90% because they have a bigger carbon footprint than us. I don't know what the current uh, carbon footprint per person in Israel is. So that was that part. But the second part, and the part that I'm more involved in, was to say, well, however good we and other countries are at reducing greenhouse gas emissions because of the juggernaut of what we've pumped into the atmosphere over the last 150 years, because of that, the climate is going to change. And so we have to have a national adaptation program that says we're going to adapt to whatever climate we are going to experience in our children's and grandchildren's generation. Importantly, this uh, act, this law, established uh, what was called the committee, what is called the Committee on Climate Change, of which I'm a member, 
and I chair the Adaptation Subcommittee, which have two roles. On the one hand, we pre prevent, present the government with an analysis. Here's what you need to do to reduce the greenhouse gas footprint. Here's what you need to do to adapt. And on the other hand, we act as a watchdog. So we report to Parliament to say, is the government doing what we've advised? And I'm going to say a little bit about uh, adaptation. I'm not going to talk about the mitigation story because there isn't time. But if you think, and I'm sure this is familiar to many of you, if you think about uh, mitigation and adaptation, they present very different problems. Because uh, mitigation nationally, and if we had a global agreement to follow on the Tokyo Agreement, maybe in Paris we will, there'll be a clear target, and it will be measurable. There'll be a standard metric, the Kyoto Greenhouse Gas List, and uh, the, uh, the sources of greenhouse gases will be known, can be monitored and addressed. On the other hand, with adaptation, there is no agreed target, nationally or internationally. No one knows what being adapted, how you would measure it. Um, and there's no, uh, there's no metric. It will vary from country to country. And importantly, we don't actually know what it is we're adapting to, because although we are confident with a high degree, uh, IPCC, uh, latest report, a high degree of confidence that, um, sorry, what have I done there, that the climate is going to change, it'll warm, there'll be other changes, but we don't know exactly what and when, and particularly when you get to the regional and local level. So adaptation is more of an unknown territory in some ways. So how did we start our work? Well, the starting point was to ask the uh, UK Meteorological Office to tell us what they thought from the best modeling they could do at fine scale resolution the climate would be in, um, in the latter part of the uh, 21st century. And this is what the Met Office projections for the UK suggest, and these are obviously only prob probabilities, that we will end up with higher temperatures, maybe a couple of degrees warmer on average in the UK, which some people would say is a good thing, since we're cold and wet. We're likely to end up with uh, heavier rain in the winter and drier summers, long periods of drought, will be affected as, uh, as your country will be by sea level rise, and that's a big unknown. It could be a few centimeters, it could be as much as nearly a meter by the end of the century, depending on all sorts of unknowns. And a meter sea rise would have drastic effects on many parts of the United Kingdom. And importantly, uh, the projections suggest there will be an increased frequency of extreme weather events, intensity of rainstorms, of windstorms, and so on. And that last, was illustrated, this is just one example, this is the winter just past, 2013-14, was the wettest winter on record since records began, and this shows you the deviation from the average in terms of rainfall. This shows you the then um, Secretary of State for the Environment, Food and Rural Affairs, who lost his job because he turned up in what became known as Welly Gate, everything is now known as Something Gate after Watergate. He turned up to these flood-ridden areas in the southwest wearing polished shoes rather than a pair of Wellingtons, and so he lost his job. Um, and there are the locals uh, berating him. So we have a set of projections, but they're not uh, certain in their magnitude and their timing. But those projections were then used to feed into a risk assessment, because the first thing you want to do is say, well, what are the risks we face? And that risk assessment was carried out and published uh, about um, two years ago, and that suggested, and I won't go into the details of how this risk assessment was carried out, all I'll say it was not a brilliant job. We didn't do it, uh, external contractor did it, but we advised and we said it could be done much better. But what it suggested was the main risks in the UK, and these are probably correct because they're fairly obvious, will be an increased risk of flooding, at the same time an increased risk of water shortage, because although most of you who've been to the UK will think of uh, uh, Britain as a fairly continuously raining country and very green, actually particularly in the southeast, which is the most populated area, we are quite water stressed. And that will become more serious if, um, if there are long periods of drought. Uh, heat mortality, we're very poorly adapted to heat in our buildings. We don't have air conditioning and most of the public buildings and private buildings are poorly protected from heat. Uh, increased energy requirement for cooling and maybe introduction of new pests and diseases. On the other hand, there could be some, sa some benefits, warmer winters, less coal mortality, maybe savings from heating, maybe new agricultural products could be grown, and optimistically, if uh, the coast of England becomes like the Mediterranean, maybe more tourists will want to come. Uh, that is quite optimistic. Um, 
this risk assessment had many flaws, but one of which was that it only really focused on a very small part of this matrix. So this is saying uh, impacts are rising in the UK directly as a result of climate change acting on the UK. At the other extreme, there could be large-scale tipping points that are not to do with the impacts on the UK, but to impacts elsewhere in the world. Maybe climate migrants, maybe major disruption to key supply chains. So this is only a very partial assessment of the risks, and the Act of Parliament requires this risk assessment to be repeated every five years, and the second risk assessment, which will be due in 2017, which we are carrying out, the Adaptation Subcommittee, will be more comprehensive in looking at the various cells in this matrix. So the question that we are now focused on is, that, is the following. After the publication of the risk assessment, the government then produced a national adaptation program, which has over 350 specific adaptation objectives. And we said to the government, before they published this, be, be warned, we are going to, when we publish our report, which is due out next summer on this national adaptation program, the first report, we are going to do it in a very quantitative analytical way. So we are going to develop a whole set of metrics of indicators of adaptation, and we will be asking, has your program led these metrics in the right direction or the wrong direction? So that's what we have very much focused on, is trying to measure how do you actually quantify progress towards a more resilient nation, a more resilient country. And I'm not going to go, and we've got dozens and dozens of measures now, so we won't necessarily use all of them, but here's, just to give you a flavor, here's one sort of example. Uh, I talked about flooding as probably the biggest single risk that will arise. The intensity of rainfall combined with sea level rise uh, will increase flood risk. And every year in the UK, a lot of properties get flooded. So what is happening at the moment to deal with that? There are two things you can do. You can either say, well, the properties that are already built in flood risk areas are um, at risk and we should spend money on defending them. Or you can say, in the future, we should think very carefully about where we put new property. And I'll just to comment on the latter. If you look at, this is, um, this is the annual growth rate in the number of properties, and the blue is 2001 to 2008, and then the green is 2008 to 2011. And the main point to see is that development in areas of flood risk around rivers, river floodplain, which is where many houses are built, is at a higher rate. Uh, development is much higher inside the floodplain than it is in outside floodplain areas, whether it's uh, river or coastal floodplain. So we are still building houses in the wrong place, and that's saving up costs for the future, because once you've built them, you have to build flood defenses. And the government, because we're short of money in our country, is not building flood defenses at anything like the rate that it would need to build them to protect these future properties. And it's going to get worse, because at the moment, uh, all people who live in flood risk areas uh, have a special deal with the insurance uh, uh, business. And the deal is that everybody in the country, regardless of whether you're in a flood risk area, pays a slight tax on their insurance. And that tax is used then to subsidize the people who live in flood risk areas. But that scheme is going to come to an end in the next 20 years. So at the end of that, people who live in these areas and whose houses are being built in these areas won't be able to insure their homes. So that's just one example of a measure that we will be reporting on how this changes over time. To look at water supply at the other end, this is water coming out of the tap. The, um, the, the risk assessment suggests that there will be a, a demand supply deficit in the United Kingdom by the mid-2020s uh, of about um, uh, 1,200 megalitres per day with a very big confidence interval. The water companies are aware of this. In the UK, water is owned by private companies. It was privatised about uh, 30 years ago by Mar Margaret Thatcher. And they have plans. Uh, so what they want to do is to um, reduce oh. demand. They want to cut leakage. We have very high loss from leakage. Uh, but they want to put a large amount of emphasis on increasing supply by building more reservoirs. And if they do all of that successfully uh, and uh, with this um, central projection, they will bring the country back into water balance. But at this low end, we could, uh, the extreme projections, we could still be uh, 1,600 megalitres per day short of water coming out of the tap. So that's not a very robust scenario. I wouldn't like to think that my uh, 
uh, grandson was dependent on this projection for him to be able to have a drink of water out of the tap because there's a very big range of uncertainty. So what's the obvious uh, area to focus on? It's demand reduction. So we said to the government, really what you should do is make people pay for water. In, this, in the UK, uh, most people don't have to pay per unit of water they use. Metering is very patchy. And if you look at the time trend, uh, metered households in red, consumption is going down over time non-metered households, consumption is going up. So the obvious thing to do if you want to reduce demand is to meter more households. The government says, well, we are metering households in the areas where water is short. We say, aha, that's not the right answer because you've got to look forward. Where is water going to be short in 20, 30 years' time? Because you ought to act now if you're adapting rather than waiting till it's too late. And if you look at the proportion of households that are metered, against uh, projected supply, demand, surplus or deficit uh, by the uh, 2020s, I think this is, or 20, 2035, you can see there's no relationship. So we're, each dot is a water company, so the government hasn't got a policy which says we're anticipating where water shortage will be, they're being purely reactive. So those are just some examples of how we're trying to measure adaptation and try and hold the government to account to make sure they're adopting policies that are evidence-based. Before I came to Israel, I looked at uh, this document. I, and some of you I know are involved in the uh, Climate Change Information Center. And I see that the priorities that are identified are similar to ours in the sense that they relate to water comes top, sea level rise is quite high up, and so is uh, uh, extreme events. And you obviously have a very different climate, a very different landscape, so the details will be different. And I would be interested to know either uh, now or in some future conversation to what extent uh, in the academic community or uh, government advisors are developing metrics to see whether these priorities are being addressed by the government in its adaptation program. Now, in the last few minutes, how much longer have I got? About five? Five minutes or less? Five, okay. Okay. Yeah, I'm going to talk about the too difficult trade. And the way I talk about the too difficult trade to introduce it is, is this. This is, uh, just picked this off the web uh, last week. This is an article in one of our daily broadsheets, the Daily Telegraph, uh, about a month ago, triumphant. It says, look, the UK economy is growing more rapidly than previously thought, and it now is uh, uh, top of the world league table. UK economy is growing at 3% a year, uh, better than US, Germany, France, Japan, and Italy. Great news. Uh, perhaps it is, perhaps it isn't. But every government everywhere in the world, one of its measures of success is GDP growth. And when I arrived in Israel, one of the things that the British ambassador told me in the first evening that the per capita GDP in Israel is about $30,000. It's a measure of how well you're doing. Okay, so you're doing well. $30,000 per capita is a good measure of Israel's success. However, if you ask leading economists, and here's Joe Stieglitz, Nobel Prize winner, he's saying, well, maybe GDP isn't the right answer. It's not a measure of societal well-being. It may be the wrong objective. And one way to think about that is if we look at the carbon footprint of the average citizen, if everybody in the world today had a carbon footprint like the average American, and I'm not pointing you, you Dan, particularly, uh, but uh, I know uh, Dan Rubenstein's a friend of mine from the States is here, but the average American footprint is uh, 10 times the global average. So it would be equivalent if everybody today switching a magic switch uh, lived like the average American, it would be equivalent to having over 70 billion people on the planet. And that clearly ain't going to work. So we can't all aspire, can't everybody in the world aspire to be like an American. Um, here's another thought from another economist, who uh, Robert Skidelsky, who is a, a British economist uh, from the Keynesian sort of lefty school of economics, is saying that uh, economic growth isn't making us any happier, um, but it's environmentally disastrous, and therefore uh, uh, we shouldn't be pursuing endless growth. So my, my point is that the, the too difficult tray is a tray in which um, all of us, our lifestyles and our governments that we've elected uh, and business is heading down a track which we all know is 
unsuitable for the long term. It, we just can't carry on in this way. Uh, in her latest book, Naomi Klein, puts it slightly differently. She says um, it's, uh, the climate change is a collective challenge, and unfortunately, we're in a world in which um, everybody wants to consume more, they want less regulation, uh, they want uh, private business to be the driver, enterprise, uh, private enterprise, and people are interested in short-term gain, short-term profits. So we've got the wrong model. Maybe we have. I'm just really posing it as a question. Is there an alternative model? Um, well, quite a few people have written about this. But one I found quite intriguing report, which was actually produced by some conservative politicians in the UK Parliament, uh, was published uh, just a few months ago. Uh, what this, uh, led by a friend of mine actually called Laura Sands, who is a conservative MP, and what she was asked by the Chancellor of the Exchequer, our, our finance minister, to look at alternatives to GDP. And there are two things that she, she realized, and I think they're both quite good insights. When you look at the government's strategy for growth of the economy, nowhere, nowhere in their strategic documents do they mention the word profit. If you were running a business, you don't just measure turnover, you're interested in whether you're actually making any money. It wouldn't help to double the size of the business if you were actually not making any money. So one thing the government should do is think about whether it's making any profit rather than whether it's just churning through a lot of money, which is what GDP is. But more importantly, she suggests that rather than measuring our economic success as per capita GDP, that's labor efficiency, how much money do we pass through the economy per person, we should think of resource efficiency. So measure uh, our efficiency of use of resources rather than our efficiency of use of labor. So that may be a one way of reframing the policy debate. But what does science have to say about this? How do we get people to think differently? Is there a different scientific, is there a scientific model or scientific evidence that would support a different behavioral model? Well, one way to look at it is that climate change and other issues are part of the tragedy of the commons. And um, the recently deceased Nobel Prize winner in economics, Lynn Ostrom, uh, tried to identify in cultures, in societies where the tragedy of the commons has been successfully addressed, what were the features? And these are the things that she identified. I won't go through the list. But basically, one of the difficulties is for a global solution is that managing resources sustainably requires small scale, requires trust, authority, and reciprocity, which works in small communities, often in indigenous peoples, but doesn't work at a global level. Another uh, insight from science that's become very fashionable from uh, behavioral economics is uh, summarized in this book by uh, Richard uh, Thaler and Cass Sunstein, uh, so-called nudging. By insights into human psychology, maybe you can frame propositions in such a way that people are more likely to do the right thing than they would otherwise. And for example, if you set the default option for uh, motor car insurance as everybody as a default has to have comprehensive cover and you opt out, then most people end up with comprehensive cover. If you set the default as third party only, then most people end up with third party insurance. So altering defaults, and I won't go through all the rest of it, but that's a kind of soft approach. Um, I don't think that will take us very far. And if, you, if this is really ultimately about behavior change, how do we change all of our behaviors and what can science tell us, and I'm now thinking of social science as well as natural science, about to change our behaviors, we have to look back at successful cases of behavior change. And the ones that I always think in the UK are the most successful population level behavior changes are to do with drink driving, wearing seat belts, and smoking. So when I was a student, you go to a country pub in your car, uh, and the barman would say at the end of the evening, would you like to have another drink for the road? Have a last drink before you set off and drive home. Inconceivable today. Um, in the UK in 1950, 75% of adult males smoked. Today, it's about 20% of adult males smoked. When seat belts were first introduced, nobody wore them. They weren't used to them now. Everybody feels uncomfortable if they set off to drive without wearing a seat belt. So those are population level massive behavior changes, but they weren't brought about by uh, nudging or by um, advertising or, or um, simple persuasion. They were brought, brought about by legislation and in the case of smoking, taxation. So in a way, the answer has to be 
that government intervention is going to be necessary as part of the picture of changing from what we're doing now, which is consuming too much and behaving unsustainably, to doing what we need to do in the future, which is to consume less and more, consume smarter and think longer term. So the question really is uh, whether we can change our behavior in such a way that we can save the planet and in some cases save ourselves as well. And thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much, Professor Lord. Perhaps. Uh, you would like to answer? I'm happy to answer questions. Yes. If there are few questions, not few more questions than two, life, first for life. <laughs> it's better to see them. It's better to see them like that. Yeah. No, no, yes, you, question, please. please. Let's show you put a pregnant woman there. <laughs> Okay, thank you. <laughs> yes, please. You mentioned extreme events in climate change. Sorry? Uh, you mentioned extreme events becoming yes. more frequent and climate change becoming yeah. more extreme. What is your opinion is more important? Is the extreme event or the change in the, the gradual change? Um, <clears throat> short answer, I don't know. Um, the, tr the question was, in the impacts of climate change, will the uh, steady trends to warming, sea level rise, um, whatever, be more important or less important than the increase in intensity of extreme events? And I think I say the answer is I don't know. And I don't think that the climate scientists could tell us the answer. I'm not a climate scientist. I'm, I'm an ecologist. But... Um, I think we have to prepare for both, and the answer also will probably vary according to local conditions. In some places, the, uh, um, if you live in a very low-lying island country like the Maldives, maybe sea level rise will be the, the most critical thing. In the UK, it may well be extreme events, particularly rainfall. Yeah. yeah. Um, from your experience, what is the proportion in the, in the way to convince politicians to change their minds, mm -hmm. to act? What is the proportion between science, public relation, and political skill? Okay, so what's the, if you want to influence uh, politicians with science, what's the role of scientific evidence? Beat them over the head with evidence. What's the uh, role of public relations? Be good at communicating it. And what's the role of political skill? And the answer is all, th all of the above. Um, so there's no magic formula of mix. I would add one other thing, um, which ministers have often said to me, is about trust. So, you know, if you take um, something that I didn't talk about, uh, let's say uh, legislation to do with um, regulating the fat content of food, which is some scientists would say people are getting too fat, we're eating too many calories, so the, there should be regulation either on sugar or on fat or something like that. Now, the food industry will lobby very hard with lots of rigorous scientific evidence. Plenty of distinguished scientists will be wheeled up in front of ministers saying this is the completely wrong approach. That's not the issue. It's to do with exercise. And then you'll get public health scientists will come along and say, no, this is all about consumption. The minister has to say, well, who do I trust? Who would I believe? So I think I would add to your list uh, trust. Building relationships of trust with politicians is hugely important. And that's a very soft skill which is hard to, you can't bottle it and say, have a drink of trust, now you trust me. Um, I don't know how you do it, but I think it's hugely important. And, um, but I think for us as scientists, whether you're staying in the ecological field setting or in your laboratory or like I've done, go over to the dark side and talk to politicians directly. I think one key thing is we have to be clear on what the evidence does and doesn't say. Because it's all tempting, you kind of confuse your wish to what the evidence would say with what it actually says and you might slightly overstate the case. So when I did the original review of bovine TB, it could have been easy to say to the government, um, 
well, badgers are a problem, but I don't think that killing badgers will really work. But I had to be honest, and I said, we don't know. And the answer is, if you want to find out, you need to do some research. Uh, so I think being honest and true to the evidence is really important for our reputation. As soon as we step over that divide between uh, being as rational and impartial as we can, and it's always difficult to do that, and being an advocate, then, and it's always tempting, particularly environmental issues, to become an advocate, then we diminish our credibility as scientists. We may raise our credibility as lobbyists, but that's a balance. So I would say there's no magic formula. Trust is really important, but also we as scientists should be truthful to what we know and understand and acknowledge the limits of our, you know, often the answer is we can't be absolutely sure because particularly with environmental matters, it's not like you can do something with a test tube and a pipette. It's something much more uncertain. Last question, please. Uriel. Um, you said that uh, you devised uh, in your committee on adaptation the yes. suit of uh, indicators yes. for adaptations. But it is a strive or a quest or a strive towards resilience. Yes. Do you have an indicator for resilience? Yeah. What is your resilience uh, first? <laughs> yeah, I'm glad you spotted that I slipped that word resilience in because I think um, the link is that we don't know what it is that we're adapting to. No one can tell us precisely what the climate will be in 2080. But we know it's going to be different and we have some fuzzy hints from the Met Office what it might be. So what we have to do is to um, adopt strategies that will be resilient in a whole range of climate scenarios. And some of these will be sensible things to do anyway, like using water more carefully is sensible in any case. It doesn't matter what the future climate is. We should treat water, as you do in this country, as a precious resource that we pay for when we use it. In the same way, we should be, whatever the future holds, we shouldn't be slapping up more and more houses in high flood risk areas without at least thinking about how we're going to defend those houses in the future and who's going to pay for that. So I think um, you're right to say resilience is key because we don't know what it is we're adapting to. Uh, but I still think that many of these measures will be measures of resilience as well as measures of adaptation. So I think there's quite a lot of overlap. But thank you for drawing attention to that. Thank you very much for your contribution. Thank, thank you very much. I, what I can see that we leave many more problems for the new generation. Absolutely, yes. <laughs>